we will begin then. We are here today on our case number 1CACV170656, Amston versus Buckeye Water Conservation and Drainage District. Uh, Council, as you know, you're allotted 20 minutes for your argument. The appellant may reserve any amount of time you'd like to use in rebuttal. If you do decide to reserve time, you're in charge of keeping track of it for yourself because the clock on the podium will reflect the total amount you have remaining, including what you might have decided to reserve. We record these proceedings, so we'd be grateful to you if, when you approach the podium if you would give us your name and the name of your client for our recording. This is a very interesting case. We have studied the record and the briefs and the cases that apply. We've also discussed the case uh, in our conferences. So with that, Mr. Abney, you may proceed. May it please the court, my name is David Abney. I'm here representing uh, Mr. Amston. Uh, my co-counsel is Zachary Muscatel. Thank you very much for the chance to have an argument or a discussion with you about the case. Uh, I have a bit of a summer cold, which is inflicting me with some unusual symptoms, including uh, my hearing's a little bit off. So if, if I don't quite understand a question first time around, it's not my usual lack of comprehension. It's because I've, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Um, the first point I'd like to address is whether Mr. Amson was a trespasser. The common law for centuries has held that if you go onto another's property for a public necessity to help somebody else that you reasonably believe is in danger and requires assistance, immediate assistance, you're not considered to be a trespasser. You are to be treated as a licensee. Uh, as a licensee, the, the landowner has a duty to uh, avoid creating hidden conditions and to warn you about hidden conditions on the land that might injure you. You can tell by taking a look at the photos that are in the briefs uh, that the irrigation box at night would be a perfect trap. You just, you'd walk along and unless you had a flashlight in your hand looking down, you would go right in it. So that, that qualifies as a hidden condition. There should have been a warning given to a licensee. But doesn't that rule apply only when the, the owner or possessor uh, knows you're there or expects you to show up in the case of the rest of the, the firefighters or the repair people? No, I don't think so. I, th I think it's it's when a landowner should reasonably understand that someone might enter the property. I mean, it's, it's possible uh, there's going to be an accident. Uh, possible somebody could be walking their dog in the vicinity and the dog goes off the path and a little bit and you go to get the dog. Could be somebody walking or biking the area that steps off the, off the road for a minute to adjust shoes or equipment or any, any number of things you could think of. Uh, that box is awfully close to the road. Exactly how close is something that's not in the record since we were, the case ended in a motion for judgment on the pleadings, which is essentially the same as a motion to dismiss as far as the standards are concerned. Uh, so it would be up to a jury to say if it's really so close that you really, as a landowner, you should have taken some measures because people could deviate from the roadway, which is what we're dealing with in the Restatement 358, deviate somewhat from your travel and uh, just a couple steps off the road and there you are, you're in the hole. In the, in the, the licensee because you are a rescuer category of cases. Yes, Your Honor. As I understand it, the argument is that, that would uh, trigger application of Restatement Second 345, which expressly states what the duty of a possessor is to to a rescuer or someone who comes on who is privileged to come on. Yeah. What what what's the what's the best case you have for uh, the, the 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 question that I'm that is troubling me, which is the level of knowledge that that the landowner needs to have as to you coming on the property. The best case I have. I yeah, mean, I mean, what is there another rescue case or another repair case? Uh, well, I'm not talking about the 368 cases where you need to use the bushes. I think off the top of my head, I can't. I can't name you a particular case. Huh. Uh, what I have is the general principle, and as far as somebody coming onto the land. I don't. I think maybe the cases don't make it to the records because it's just one of those obvious things. If you go onto somebody else's land to give a hand and you're hurt, then you get the status as a licensee, and the law gives you some protection yeah. as opposed to what you get for a trespasser. Of course, yeah, trespass, oh. trespassers are just open game with you know what we learn in law school about the trap gun, which I always think is a wonderful idea, but it's pretty cruel. 
you know, you have the gun that's hooked up to the door, you open the door and it, boom, it goes off. And yeah, that's really not a nice way to greet even a trespasser. But uh, for a licensee, it's it's not a lot of care. And you, as a light, as an owner of the land, you should expect that sometime people will go onto that land uh, in a public necessity sense, whether it's to chase a pet, uh, or to or to step out step out for your car for a few steps to go help somebody else who's been in an accident, or perhaps you just stop there on your own because your vehicle has motor problems. You walk around to the trunk, you walk around the other side, you walk far enough, and boom, you're right in the irrigation box again. So there's there's all kinds of scenarios there. I don't know of a specific case. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, the Saladay Doctrine has also been applied as a defense. Uh, my position, I, we laid out in the briefs fairly well, is that it doesn't apply to licensees. Uh, and the only, the only time it has been applied in the reported decision has been to minors uh, under an attractive nuisance kind of theory. Uh, there was the one oddball case of uh, Tressie Sutter in the 1930s who was wandering around in the back of her yard and, and in an alley to try to take some garbage out. And as the, as the Supreme Court said, why didn't she have a torch, a light, a match, something? Uh, but, and that was thrown out for, for poor Tressie after she won $1,700, which is a lot of money back then. Uh, it was thrown out because the, the she was just too negligent, uh, there, and there was no negligence on the part of the city, and she was the one, 100%. But the Salade was mentioned but not applied. But all the other cases where Salade has been applied have been minors, and it probably should be confined to that. Well, don't we know, though, from the Hersey case that, it, that, that the, the doctrine applies um, not only to attractive nuisance cases? Because Hersey wasn't, didn't involve an attractive nuisance. It's been applied to minors. It started out as attractive nuisance. Right, but is an attractive nuisance a minor case? I mean, a minor situation generally. You, yes, I, I assume. Unless you, yes. So if we so if we say it's been broadened to cases other than attractive nuisance, I think maybe we have to part and parcel with that. Is it may apply to an adult situation. Maybe, but that would be that would be stretching it quite a bit. Okay. Of course, the odd thing about the cell date, Doctor. But in in Hussey, it was a, a child who was uh, propelled onto the 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 ditch because of a car accident. Yeah, motor vehicle accident. Yeah. If it was an adult rather than a child, would the results have been the same? I don't know. I don't know. That's that's a very good point. It was a some sort of bus, uh, like a, a family bus. VW bus. Yeah, VW. I had I had this image of a, you know, psychedelic painted yeah, yeah, bus exactly. when this poor thing happened. But she she gets to the roof or gets to the side and manages, and then just goes and tumbles into the water. What, what? Uh, you're right, though. That's that's that is an oddball case. It fits within the pattern only applied to minors, but it's not the attractive nuisance kind of thing. What? Uh, when a when a plaintiff is raising a constitutional challenge under the uh, damages provision or the anti-abrogation provision, what must the plaintiff, uh, what must the, the the challenger show? That there has on the abrogation clause that there has been uh, an abrogation of a cause of action that was recognized at the common law, or that would be recognized at the common law if you want to stretch it a little bit. But the classic one is recognized at the common law. Now, you may say to me at this point, Maha, Mr. Abney, Salde Doctrine arose in 1909, and we became a state in 1912. Uh, and I would say to you, the oddball thing about Salde Doctrine is it did not involve irrigation ditches. It did not involve water supply companies. It involved a, a, a smelter. And the, the poor girl, Katie Salade, was caught in a flume that had been, uh, children in the area had been you know, bathing and fooling around in this long, elevated flume of water. And, the, and the flume, a flume of water in a, in a smelting corporation is used to, to move materials around, to wash out ores, that sort of thing. It's not used for irrigation. The water just spills through it and is discarded, usually. So she gets caught in the flume, and it gets thrown down the flume, and, and, and 20 feet in the air, the flume ends, and she crashes to the ground. She's badly hurt. They actually take her to the, the company hospital, Old Dominion Company Hospital, where she dies. But it wasn't an irrigation district at all. So in a classic sense, what we have here is a Saladay doctrine that's later applied to irrigation districts and, of course, the, it, within itself talks about irrigation and water delivery. And that's all pure, that's all dicta. 
at the time uh, when Arizona became a state, there should have been and would have been, I believe, under the common law, a right to sue for these, these kinds of damages. It wasn't until later, and getting into the 1930s and so on, and move forward into the 40s and 50s, that the Salde Doctrine is applied gr dramatically to irrigation districts and water companies. So it's, it's a very odd thing. I had a, a definite sense. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat of a historian, got a PhD in it, not that I ever use it, but uh, which, which is probably the reason for that big appendix. Uh, but I was struck by uh, how, how they reached out to provide this protection to irrigation companies, water, water companies. And of course, right about this time, um, all these projects were coming in. It's a product of the era. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, Roosevelt Dam, I think, would be completed the next year. I mean, or the year after that. There's a huge amount of federal money coming into this to the territory. Uh, and I, th I think maybe the court was reaching out to try to give a favor to an industry that it regarded as very important. Some parts of the state still incredibly really important. Yuma, for instance, there's immense irrigation works in Yuma. Uh, oddly enough, most of them unfenced. If you ever if you ever look at them. Uh, and that's one reason why you, you hardly ever read about a CAP project, uh, Central, Central Arizona project, drowning because they have fences along the sides. And the reason is not to protect people. It's to keep the feds say it's that we did that to keep wildlife what, out what, of our, uh, our canals. What about the connection? What about the, the argument uh, that um, the Saladay Doctrine doesn't preclude a negligence claim against an irrigation company. It simply raises the bar because even if one is a trespasser without privilege, well, uh, one may still recover uh, uh, upon proof of wanton misconduct. Yes, and, and there have been cases to that effect. So it, I agree, it can, it can and does seem to raise the bar. Although it's viewed in strange ways by commentators in courts. You hear a lot of language that makes it sound like an absolute immunity. Uh -huh. And in many situations it is, but there can be situations where a willfulness and wantonness. And perhaps if this case had go forward, there could be um, a discovery and, and uh, refinement of the complaint and, and more disclosure about the willful and wanton nature of that irrigation box. You look at those pictures, that's just a disaster waiting to happen to anybody in the area. Uh, it's, it, it, it looks to me like it's not even in use, but you know, I suppose it is. It's there, but it's, yeah, you could, I believe, alleged that willful and wanton here. Um, okay, and then I guess my last pitch is the Salve Doctrine. Uh, I've been trying for over a decade to find a case where I could come up and get somebody to throw it out. Uh, I don't know if you can do it. Uh, on, on constitutional grounds, maybe. I don't think it's ever been addressed on constitutional grounds. Uh, but it is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, it's. It, you give one industry this wonderful privilege and allow it to go on this way, and you, what happens is you get nobody taking care the way they should. Uh, public education, fencing, piping, covering canals, uh, uh, all kinds of things, prosecuting vigorously anybody who trespasses, all kinds of things that can be done and that haven't been done for a long, long time in Arizona, and hundreds and hundreds of people have drowned, in part, because, I submit to you, because of that. It's really time to stop this. We, we're going to be the right court to address that issue, to are we? On constitutional grounds, you would be, uh, because I don't think anybody's addressed the constitutionality. Uh, but on other grounds, uh, I think you're limited to being, we respectfully recommend, which would be a wonderful thing to do, if you could. The, the other question I have for you is, the, the constitutionality issues were raised at, at the beginning, and they were raised in, in, in motions after the courts were really correct, and if, if they are, aren't they brave? Well, wisdom sometimes comes a little late. I, I understand. And yes, however, uh, whether they're waived or not is is a matter of jurisprudence with the court. It's not an ironclad rule, and you may, if you regard the principles as being fundamentally fundamentally important, you can, in any particular case that you believe that would serve the ends of justice, to say it's not been waived. Uh, you could have raised it earlier and maybe raised it better, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very good points. Well, it's a legal issue. Yes. So the trial court's it is not. I mean, obviously, this is a matter where there was no evidence taken. There wasn't. A, there was no evidence taken on the motion. So. Yeah. 
Well, you, you do the best you can with what you have, and at the trial court, sometimes it's in the rush of things, it's hard to, to deal with, with these. But anyway, to this, uh, one, one last thing on the Saturday Doctrine. I hope that uh, if, if you can't deal with it on constitutional grounds, that perhaps you could say this is really a bad idea, and uh, or words to that effect. It might help a little bit on the next round if there is a next round. I think you're overly optimistic about it. I try to be. Our words, but we take your point. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Karen Stafford on behalf of the Buckeye Water Conservation and Drainage District. Um, I want to first address the idea that um, Saladay is somehow um, applicable only to minors or applicable only to those, uh, to, to the attractive nuisance doctrine. The point of Saladay, which is, which is why it's important to know this, because the appellant spends a lot of time in his briefing talking about why he shouldn't be considered a trespasser and why he should fit into these exceptions that aren't adopted in Arizona law at all, but why he should fit into these exceptions. And yet all of that is completely irrelevant, really, because even if he was a trespasser, uh, a licensee, as he argues, the claims would still be barred by the Saladay Doctrine. The Saladay Doctrine, really, that analysis only needs to be undergone when we are dealing with someone who benefits from a trespasser exception, like children. So you see Saladay applied over and over and again in cases with minors because children benefit from an exception. Often they're not considered trespassers because of the attractive nuisance doctrine. So early on in Saladay, all, all Saladay held was that we're not going to allow children to benefit from this trespasser exception, and we're going to apply this immunity in that in that regard. But if a trespasser is just a trespasser and doesn't and benefit from any of those exceptions, then it's really not even necessary to engage in the Saladay analysis because um, there is no heightened duty of care to a trespasser other than not acting willfully and wantonly. And it's very important to note that there has been no allegation in the complaint that there was willful and wanton conduct. And in fact, in our rule 12C motion to the trial court. We argued that there was no allegation of willful and wanton conduct. The appellant did not refute that and conceded that. Um, and so that any argument now that there was some willful and wanton conduct is not pled and it's definitely been waived. If, if, if Saladay applies, uh, may, may a plaintiff recover upon proof of willful or wanton misconduct? Under uh, some of the case law, yes, I would say in Harris, they talked about this public be damned conduct, where if uh, in that particular case, the irrigation district kind of knowingly, you know, uh, allowed a hazard to continue, although very importantly in Harris, the hazard in that case was not a conduit of the water delivery system, which is another reason why that case didn't fall within the neat parameters of Saladay, because it didn't involve an irrigation box or a canal or a culvert or a pump house or any of these right, other but what things. I'm, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is what's the effect of application of Saladay? Does it merely heighten the burden of proof upon any plaintiff or does it bar the claim? Uh, I agree with your point earlier. It does not bar the claim. This is not absolute immunity, and I think the courts have made that clear repeatedly after, through their application of this doctrine, that it's not absolute immunity. And in fact, I think it just heightens the burden of proof, like you've said, to say that if there was willful and wanton conduct, then potentially a defendant couldn't uh, uh, enjoy the immunity under Saladay. Um, here, that's not at issue because it hasn't been alleged, um, and nor, and you know, appellant has conceded that it hasn't been alleged to the trial court. Um, it's important also to note that the Saladay Doctrine is not an outdated relic of the past. And I know um, there was some discussion of how it was a product of the early 1900s, you know, in the development of our desert and the delivery of the water system. But in as recent as 1993, this court applied Saladay in the Salt River Valley Water Users Association case. And that case made some ex very, very important holdings. First of all, it rejected the exact same public policy arguments that are being raised today, that it's outdated, that it's a relic of the past, that it's unfair. All of these public policy arguments um, that are being raised that this court rejected in Salt River. Um, they also held that the um, 
that the Court of Appeals is bound by the decisions of the Arizona Supreme Court. And that has actually been held time and time again, most recently in Salt River, but also in Hersey, also in Dombrowski, uh, or excuse me, that was a Supreme Court case, but also in all of the cases that have applied uh, Saladay, the Court of Appeals has recognized that this is good Arizona law and only the Arizona Supreme Court would have the power to change that or the legislature. Um, it's also important to note that the Salt River Valley Water Users case in 1993, um, the, the appellant did petition for review to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court denied review, which indicates to me that the Supreme Court is not interested, at least at that time, in reviewing the, the uh, application of the Saladay Doctrine. Well, 25 years ago it wasn't. That is correct. Um, it's certainly not 100 years ago um, in the early 1900s. It's definitely in more recent urban times. And the reason I say that is because the argument that Saladay was really only relevant during the time when our state was growing and developing, I think is a, mis is, is a misunderstanding of the case law because uh, throughout time, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and as recently as the 90s, this court and the Arizona Supreme Court has uh, uh, repeatedly applied Saladay to provide immunity to irrigation districts in many times, first of all, many times it is with children who are, uh, the allegation is they're not trespassers because of the attractive nuisance, but it has been applied in cases of adults. And I would disagree with appellant that the Sutter case was not about Saladay. The Sutter case involved an irrigation box exactly that, what is that issue here, an irrigation box. And in that case, the adult woman who went to take her trash out in the alley fell into an open irrigation box. The Saladay doctrine was applied in that case case, presumably because she was not considered a trespasser because she was in her own alley. That case held that she didn't, she didn't exercise care herself. It was her fault. That's the way I read that case. I do agree that that is part of the holding. I, I agree, but I also I, I also believe they applied Saladay and talked about the immunities that are, are provided under Saladay. And my 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 assumption is that the only reason Saladay entered that analysis is because she was not considered a trespasser. And here we have the appellant and the trial court correctly held is a trespasser. But putting that aside, if we somehow want to consider him something other than a trespasser, Saladay would still apply to bar his claims. Um, also, the Saladay Doctrine was applied in Lee. Again, this involved an 11-year-old boy, so he is a minor, but the Lee case, and that was a Supreme Court case, um, really went through the discussion of that that boy was considered a trespasser. Uh, he was injured in a pump house that was adjacent to a canal, and the court felt that that was not an attractive nuisance. So he didn't benefit from an exception to trespasser status. And because he was a trespasser, there was no duty, heightened duty of care to him, and the claims were dismissed. Missed. But the court also took it a step further and said, even if there was, if it was an attractive nuisance and he was something other than a trespasser, Saladay would still bar his claims. So the cite that then in support of the argument that that Saladay might not apply to someone who's not a trespasser because he has a privilege to be on the property. I would say that Saladay particularly applies to someone who might not be a trespasser because that's really the only reason why we would engage in that analysis. Really, Saladay doesn't provide any greater protection um, than the doctrine uh, or than the idea of a trespasser status. I mean, a trespasser status is only entitled to protection against willful and wanton conduct. The same goes for the application of the Saladay doctrine. It, it's the same burden, and the only reason we talk about Saladay is if somehow the entrant is not considered a trespasser. And the reason this argument is important is because all of the arguments as to why appellant should or shouldn't be considered a trespasser really aren't relevant because Saladay bars the claims. But if for some reason this court was not inclined to, to agree that Saladay barred these claims, um, the trespass, the, the trial court was correct in, in holding that appellant was a trespasser. It's important to note that the appellant didn't raise any argument as to to the idea that he was a rescuer or that he should benefit from the restatement uh, 345 in his pleadings before judgment in the Rule 12C pleadings. This was raised for the first time post-judgment and uh, the trial court correctly found that those arguments were waived. Um, even if they're not waived, this restatement has never been adopted by any published decision in Arizona. Um, you asked the appellant, what is one case that you can rely on, your best case to talk about this 
application of this restatement. Well, I have the one case that I think is very uh, persuasive is the Lane case out of Illinois. And the Lane case, they declined to apply this exception for many reasons. One, it was not an emergency situation. Um, there were lots of other safer options. And I would say the same is true here. I know appellant wants to argue that there should be discovery, but the face of his complaint, the allegations, his own allegations assumed as true, do not support the application of this exception. He does not allege an emergency situation. He does not allege he was a rescuer. He does not allege that the uh, the, the, those involved in the accident were in were you know compromised. I think you can read the complaint to allege that he stopped his car, got off the road to assist in an accident. If that's the case, if he was a rescuer, um, you know, in, in in Arizona, we 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 adopt the rule in the restatement in a restatement unless it's contrary to something we've said before. So why, what would be wrong, what would be improper, violative of public policy to adopt the intersection of, I think it's Restatement Second 197 and 345 together? I'm not saying as applicable here, but as a general proposition, what is wrong as a matter of public policy with those those two rules? I think that's an excellent question, and I th what is wrong with that is it requires courts to conduct an inquiry into why the entrant entered the land. Was it for a noble purpose, or was it for a selfish purpose? And the reason I bring that up is because Appellant argued in his brief that Lang, shouldn't Lang is not persuasive, because in that case, the taxi cab driver was acting selfishly. Selfishly, he was trying to retrieve his fare. Um, although the restatement uh, applies, but, but when there's an accident, mm -hmm. and someone stops his car, walks into a darkened ditch to assist. What 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 would be wrong with applying that principle in that case? Well, I also think that the other part of the restatement that talks about the viability of other safer options applies in that in this case and in the case, the hypothetical case you're talking about, because there are lots of safer options than wandering around uh, desert land, unimproved desert land in the dark. Um, there are there in this particular case, and I know he's you know this this is in the court record because there's a lots of pictures in the record that were submitted by plaintiff with his Rule 12 see response motion where he shows the location of this irrigation box and I have the pictures here they are they it's for, 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 uh, he keeps referring to it as being a few feet away from the road but the pictures clearly show it's much further than a few feet away from the road those are questions of fact correct I'm asking as a legal proposition since we have some time I'm asking what as a matter of public policy what's wrong with the rule in the restatement here I think it, it, you know, it, it, the, the idea is that here, this, that. Oh, the, no, not here. In, just, okay, in, in general. As a general proposition, in the abstract, why shouldn't an Arizona court adopt the intersection of 197 and because a landowner can never be sure then who, you know, the, the idea is a landowner doesn't have to protect against unknown perils to uh, trespassers. They don't have to put up warning signs because their land is private and they haven't invited anyone on their land. So then to have uh, this exception where an unanticipated person could enter on the land without permission, without knowledge, without invitation. Well, see, I think, I think with knowledge is implicit in the, or explicit in the restatement. Yes, but how, how it, the the idea is if, if someone can enter for the purposes of rescuing someone, um, how could a landowner ever anticipate that? I know that appellant says that a landowner should anticipate motor vehicle accidents, but it's not the accident they have to anticipate. It's the need for rescue they have to anticipate. It's the need for entrance on the land that they have to anticipate. Even in the comments to the restatement, they talk about uh, someone rushing up to a burning house and falling through a step. Now, a step is meant for people to walk up. And and yet, in that in that illustration, it says the landowner is not liable to the rescuer because they didn't anticipate that, even though a step is meant for stepping. Really, it talks about a firefighter. Correct, correct. But I believe so, it also I mean, talks. The firefighter that, and I, I think what that is intended to encompass is a situation where a landowner knows his property is on fire and has to go down when he sees the truck approaching. Say, hey, be careful here. What would be wrong with that? I'm sorry. Wait, um, can you can you repeat that one time? I'm sorry. I I thought I read that comment as addressing, or that illustration as addressing, a situation in which I own property. I know that it's on fire. I know the firefighters are coming. I know there's a hole. 
I need to warn the firefighters before you go into the building, watch for the hole. What would be wrong with that? But you need to, but see in the, in the illustration, the absence of warning didn't create liability. So according to the illustration, the fact that there was an injury because of the lack of warning still didn't create liability. It didn't create any heightened duty of care. And that, that's kind of my point is when, when would this apply? Because if it doesn't apply in a situation for someone walking up steps to put out a fire, I don't see how it could apply in a situation you know, where there might be a motor vehicle accident, maybe maybe off the road far enough, maybe on unimproved land um, in the middle of nowhere that would require someone to pull over and get out of his car. This is such a far reach from what a landowner would, would be able to anticipate that I feel like this would be difficult to apply. It would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and it would require such an intensive inquiry into what the landowner would anticipate, what would be reasonable for the landowner to anticipate, and what was the purpose of the entrance entrance onto the land. Was it to rescue? Was it an emergency enough? Was it a dire enough emergency? Were there other safer options? Like in this case, that a safer option would have been to walk on the shoulder that was improved instead of on the unimproved land because there was a wide shoulder. Or, you know, would it, maybe a safer option would be call police for help. But in, in any case, all of these inquiries would have to take place if the courts were to apply this doctrine. And that's why I think we see cases where they're just not applying it because there's always there, there's it's very difficult to to argue that a landowner would anticipate an entrance when it when they don't expect a, an emergency they don't expect the need for rescue and they don't expect people to enter onto the land so how can that play into this anticipation requirement and, and so that, to me, presents the problem in, use, in applying this restatement. And in the cases I'm reading in other jurisdictions, they're not applying it very frequently or very consistently. Um, that also brings me to the other restatement, which is 368. Again, this is not a restatement that's been ever adopted by any Arizona case, um, but it talks about a deviation from the roadway through the ordinary course of travel. And there are there are uh, just cases after case that were cited in the briefs where this does not apply because when the uh, deviation is intentional. Even when the deviation was not intentional in a case called Swope um, in Illinois, when a deer uh, jumped out in the middle of the highway and the traveler swerved to miss the deer and ended up hitting a, 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 a uh, hazard on the side of the road, that still was not considered through the ordinary course of travel, um, an ordinary deviation from the roadway. And I mean, I've listed the Swope case out of Illinois, the Florida Power case out of Florida, Copper case out of Idaho, you know, and the list goes on and on where the courts are repeatedly not applying this exception, finding that this intentional pulling off to the side of the road or even swerving to avoid a hazard is not within the ordinary course of travel. It can't be said here that appellants intentionally pulling off the road, getting out of his vehicle, leaving the improved shoulder area to walk on the unimproved area. And it, it also should be noted that the irrigation box is, according to the pictures that were submitted in the record by the appellant, um, is right next to a, a canal. It's, it's, it's adjacent to the canal. So it's, you know, he talks about canal cases. Well, this is, this is not very much different. You're going to be careful not to walk in the canal and he stumbles into the junction box. Or, you know, the, or he should not be walking on the, on the unimproved desert land uninvited. I mean, that would, that would be the, uh, the, the response to that argument is there is, there are no sidewalks. This is a highway in the middle of nowhere. The point is, is I don't think there's any anticipation that there are pedestrians walking around these areas, but there is a very wide improved shoulder. And what, that is evident from the pictures that were submitted by the appellant. And so if anything, that would be the area to walk if you were going to walk at night towards another vehicle. Um, the, the, the point in all of this is, is that this is not the type of deviation from the roadway that would entitle him to an exception from the trespasser status. Under all the cases I've cited, and, and in fact, appellant hasn't cited any cases really to refute that, to say that this particular circumstance warrants a trespasser exception. Um, but again, I'll, I'll just reiterate that all of these arguments really um, are only important if Saladay didn't exist. But because Saladay does exist and it is good law and it's been repeatedly affirmed by this court and the Supreme Court, it really doesn't matter whether or not he's a trespasser because 
It would the, the Saladay doctrine would bar immunity regardless. I, I have just a minute left, so I wanted to, if, I, if there's any questions for, that you'd like me to answer for you in my remaining minute. No, I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I asked your pardon earlier. You asked me if there was a case on point that would be helpful, and I, there is. It's Mole versus uh, Roosevelt Irrigation District. I'm sorry, my brain froze because of old age. Uh, and that case involved a, a young person who had was swimming in a, a canal. Uh, it had been one of those uh, a culvert where the water is ejected from a pipe and then sucked back in. It goes back and forth, reversing the flow. The irrigation district had known about that condition, had known people were playing there, and so the court said what we had here is a licensor, licensee relationship that had been created. Uh, but since the water reversal hazard was a known ordinary par part of the pipe's operation, the licensee should have been aware of it, and the irrigation district was not liable. But in the course, it never mentioned or talked about Saladay. But in the course of discussing that, uh, Mole versus Roosevelt Irrigation District adopted Restatement Section 345. For the first restatement, there's really no difference between the first restatement and the second restatement as far as Section 345. And in doing that, the courts, the court said, Arizona, the court said, well, Arizona holds, quote, pardon me, Arizona holds that, quote, a landowner's duty to one who enters his property with a privilege and for a public purpose is no different than the duty owed to an ordinary licensee, end quote. So there's a case that's right on point. It's not only right on point, but it also adopts Section 345. I was looking at Section 345. I provided the full text on page 10 of the reply brief, and on page 9 of the reply brief and 10, I provided the full text of Section 197, Private Necessity, and 345, Persons Entering in the privilege, Exercise of a Privilege. And it really doesn't talk about the knowledge of the landowner. It, it just says that if... Um, the liability of a land possessor to one who enters the land in the exercise of a privilege, la la la, uh, is the same as the liability uh, to a licensee. So the notion in the Mole case, I, you know, I read that case and I had a hard time putting it in the context of 345, uh, as opposed to something else. But the notion, but but what you're saying is that what is relevant in the Mole case, as with respect to 345, is that. You enter the land in exercise of a privilege if the landowner knows that people are using it for recreation. Well, and, it, it, and therefore, your privilege to be there. In that case, it it got rid of the well. In that case, the um, there was no liability to that particular victim because the particular victim knew or should have known because of this water reversal was was going to was going to happen. It was a it was a known danger and the and the person still confronted it and the court said well we're not gonna we're not gonna find liability in this particular area uh, under the rules that apply to licensees okay. because there was a license or licensee relationship um, my colleague said that it does not matter if mr. Amden Amsden is a trespasser it matters greatly because if he is not a trespasser he has a privilege to be doing what he was trying to do which was trying to rescue somebody well, unfortunately, as we all know from life experience, uh, you often start out with good intentions and end up making things worse uh, or, or get, you, get yourself hurt like those kids in Thailand. Like, at least one of the divers died trying to help out those poor people. And it just it happens, but it doesn't, doesn't take away from the fact that he did what we should encourage everybody to do, uh, to come out and, and try to help out. He thought there was a danger that the people were going to suffer some sort of injury and trapped in an overturned car. You never know what's going to happen. And he, he went out of his way. Uh, and uh, as a result, got hurt. But what, what does the complaint say about his rescue uh, efforts? It describes the fact that he saw that there was a an overturned vehicle, and some he thought that somebody needed rescuing, and and not he saw that somebody needed help, and he that's why he started off in that direction. It doesn't actually use the word rescuer, but you know you just need a little thought. That's what he is. He's a rescuer. Uh, let's see. Oh, the Sally Doctrine. Back, back to my favorite theme, which I'm sure has bored the court senseless by now. But uh, when I was a young person in school in Arizona, I was taught the five C's. I don't know if you remember them. Copper, cattle, cotton, citrus, and climate. Well, times have changed as far as priority there. Climate still matters a lot in copper. But cotton and citrus are downgraded quite a bit, and cattle, I'm not sure where it is in the greater scheme of things. We have Life has changed. 
And the notion, but in any event, the notion of giving a special privilege to any particular industry uh, is just wrong. Uh, you could give it to you, why not? Why not all doctors have 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 immunity unless they, you show some sort of willful and wanton misconduct, or telecommunications, or transportation, or food? You know, anything you want to imagine that is your favorite industry that se that seems to matter to you more than anybody else. You give them a privilege. I don't think you. I don't think the law allows you to do that. Uh, and then the only other thing I'd like to say is that uh, danger invites rescue. And that's exactly what happened here. Danger invited a rescue. Uh, he, he did the best he could with that. He badly hurt his right ankle as a result. Uh, he's not a trespasser. And any, any sort of trespasser notion, notion should leave the case, which would leave the Salve Doctrine, I suppose, as their fall, fallback defense. And if that's what it is, then we'll go uh, to the clouds and have that resolved there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for your argument. Uh, thank you for you, thank you to all the lawyers for your argument and for your briefing. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. We're going to remain on the bench to allow the the, the lawyers for the next case to come forward. <laughs>